The complete biography for each of our speakers is in the forum program, so I'll only provide a brief introduction. Our first speaker is the Senior Vice President of Honda America Manufacturing. Uh, please welcome Rick Shostek. Our next speaker has worked at Honda's Murraysville plant for 30 years. He is currently Senior Manager Rob May. And our moderator today is President and CEO of the Columbus Partnership, a frequent uh, guest and uh, sometimes a monitor, uh, and that's Alex Fisher. Alex? <laughs> On behalf of our sponsors, Corner Cocosing and Castor Connections, it's a lot of C's, uh, <laughs> welcome our panelists and also Alex, here's the mic. Thanks, Rick and um, uh, Rich, and thanks uh, to Rick and Rob uh, for uh, for doing this. It's uh, it's fantastic to be able to uh, celebrate uh, with both of you all uh, and with all of the uh, Honda family. And as I kind of lead into the, the the first question, just consider for a moment uh, that uh, in 30 years uh, that we've seen uh, a, a operation grow uh, here in Ohio and in Central Ohio to 13,500 employees, $8 billion of capital investment, 15 million uh, automobiles uh, produced during that time period, 18 million engines, 14 million transmissions, $7 billion of annual purchases in the state of Ohio uh, from suppliers I think first we owe all of you and all of your colleagues a big, huge uh, congratulations and thank you. <laughs> it, it would candidly be the economic development understatement of the, of the last several decades to say that uh, uh, Honda did anything but uh, transform um, our manufacturing uh, environment uh, in the economy of uh, Central Ohio. And Rick, I think I would open it up uh, first with you just to give us a snapshot uh, here in 2012 of, um, of the current status of uh, Honda's automotive production uh, in, in Ohio. Sure will, Alex, and uh, thank you for uh, helping us out here today. Uh, I want to thank the Metropolitan Club and the sponsors, and we're really delighted, Rob and I, to, uh, to be here this afternoon, and I see so many uh, friendly faces and familiar faces in the in the audience. So thanks to everybody for uh, coming out uh, this afternoon. Yeah, current day, Alex, um, we're we're humming along right now. We have the capability, mm -hmm. the capacity to produce about 700,000 vehicles per year in Ohio between our Marysville plant and our East Liberty plant. So 700,000 per year. That's roughly equal to every other car maker in Ohio combined. So we're roughly half of the output, auto output in the, st in the state of Ohio. We've been very fortunate to have three very good new model launches just in the last 12 months. Um, at our East Liberty plant, uh, there we make the uh, CRV, and that was a total refresh of that CRV just about one year ago now. It's a very popular car uh, SUV, and it's uh, selling very well. At the same plant in East Liberty, we had a total new model change for our Acura RDX, which is also a sport utility vehicle. The last time I checked, our RDX sales were about double what they were the previous model, so that, uh, that model has been well received uh, also. And the third car that we make in uh, East Liberty is the, uh, the Cross Tour. Marysville is the plant that started it all back in 1982. We have uh, two lines uh, at Marysville versus one line at East Liberty, so we have a lot more output from Marysville. But the headline there, Alex, is the Accord. Uh, it's sitting outside there. If, if you didn't see it when you walked in, we have the first one, we, uh, first version that we made, and also the latest version. And it's an interesting to see the changes uh, over the years. But uh, that car has been really well received. It's in a very competitive segment of the market. But we're we're happy with uh, that, that vehicle. And we also produce in our Marysville Auto Plant the uh, Acura TL. Uh, at Marysville, where Rob works, we're increasing the output uh, early next year by another uh, 100 units per day to get us up to, what's that again, 1,900 per day will be coming out of Marysville uh, as of uh, the beginning of 2013. And as you mentioned, Alex, uh, our, our parts suppliers are really, the supply chain is a really important part of our business. And, and by the way, I've, I know there's a few suppliers here. If there's Honda suppliers in the audience, please raise your hand. 
There was a great article in the Columbus Dispatch on Sunday about uh, uh, Stanley. I hope uh, some of you saw that, but that's a key, one of our many key suppliers. We purchase uh, about $20 billion worth of parts from North American suppliers each year, and about a third of that is spent here in Ohio from our 150 uh, Ohio suppliers. So uh, the bottom line is, uh, Alex, things are going well right now. So 1,900 vehicles, I mean, talk about the importance of the distribution network uh, in this is a strategic location for being able to ship 1,900 vehicles a day. Yeah, it sure, it sure is. The, the majority of our uh, vehicle shipments are departing uh, the Marysville site by rail, uh, obviously by truck for some dealers who are, who are closer here, but mostly by rail, uh, heading down towards Cincinnati and then, and then heading, out, uh, heading out from there. So the outbound logistics is critical, but inbound logistics is where there's uh, a whole lot of money spent and uh, a lot of efficiency that we've uh, that we've gained over the past year. So, uh, the, the whole supply chain, including from the suppliers uh, to the logistics, is is really critical to our competitiveness. So, Rob, uh, 1983, <coughs> the first uh, Japanese uh, car to be manufactured in the United States was a, a gray and silver uh, Honda Accord with the uh, license plate USA dash zero zero one. Looks very similar to the one that's downstairs, uh, but I think it may be in the Henry Ford Museum now, which has some uh, interesting uh, symmetry. Uh, you've been there almost from the beginning, and maybe you could uh, take us back to the early days uh, and in some of your memories of what it was like uh, to be a part of this early team uh, breaking uh, uh, ground here uh, in America to do something that uh, uh, no uh, Japanese manufacturer had ever done before. Sure. Thank you, Alex. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that the only time I'm in a room with this many suits is when I go to a wedding, which isn't very often. <laughs> well, we, at, can, we can work that out for you. <laughs> and at Honda, we all wear white, so I'm really kind of out of my element right now. But anyways, uh, just to kind of put it in context, 1979 is when the motorcycle plant started. I was a freshman in high school, and obviously I had more on my mind than working at a car plant. So uh, as I got through high school, you know, toward the end is when the car plant was being built and starting up. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of buzz about Honda. And I tried to get in there. It took me a couple years. I actually uh, stopped along a pizza shop for a couple years and made pizzas for a little bit. But eventually I got an opportunity to work at Honda. And I remember the first day when I went in and they told me I was going to welding. I'm thinking, I don't know anything about welding. And then when I got inside of welding, I was even more petrified because there were sparks flying everywhere and people were doing things, I mean, sealing by hand. It was, it was crazy. But anyways, the, you know, the, the team that they put us in, because there was about 20 in my group, I believe, at the time. Um, the, the team they put us in, they welcomed us, you know, welcomed to the team and, you know, trained us. And you could tell there was a lot of sincerity and, and there was a lot of commitment to teamwork and unity. And that's the one thing that I remember from, you know, my first few days there. And uh, opportunity, you know, if you were ambitious and wanted to learn other processes, you know, there were people there ready to help you and train you and kind of get you on the path that you wanted to go down. So, you know, I, I really felt good about the first six months there. And it kind of, at some point, probably thereafter, transitioned from a job for me to a career. I mean, I love Honda. I can't imagine working anywhere else. I've been there not quite 30 years. 28 years, but nevertheless, great company. It's just been a fantastic experience for me. So you're, you're, you're pushing on your 30th high school reunion, and what would you yeah, say, what would you say to, <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to the current high school students who are coming through and uh, thinking about uh, jobs in Central Ohio and your own career path? Uh, and, you know, I think that for, for too long, many of us have have thought that uh, manufacturing became a dirty word as opposed to the word that uh, really is central to the to the American economy. Well, I would say, you know, give it a try. I, I really think that in the last 30 years, last 30 years, the way we built the car then versus today, it, it's much more efficient. You know, the environment is, is much better for the associates. We, we've done a lot of automating processes. You know, back in the early days, we had to do a lot of things by hand. You had to lift parts and seal and spot weld and do all those things that require obviously a lot of fatigue on the body but over time we've made some nice adjustments and implemented automation so I think there's 
there's definitely opportunity out there, and it's obviously a, a good paycheck. You know, I went from making $3 an hour making pizzas to $9 an hour building cars, so it wasn't a bad uh, step in the right direction for me. Alex, I really enjoy listening to Rob talk about the early days at the, at the, at the Marysville Auto Plant. And it rem reminds me that there, we do have someone in the audience here today who was the second plant manager of the Marysville Auto Plant, and his name is Scott Whitlock. Where's Scott? I saw him. There he is, way in, way in the back there. And, and Scott provided leadership at Honda at the Marysville plant and then on, a, on a, even a larger level from approximately the mid-80s through the mid-90s and is really uh, uh, a great asset to helping us, uh, help, helping us grow in, uh, uh, in Ohio. Although when Scott came up to our table here, we were having lunch, and Scott came up to our table, so he was the plant manager when Rob started. I saw Rob flinch when Scott <laughs> came up. I sort of, uh, I sort of got the impression that Scott still may be in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There, just a quick story. I remember I was a staff. I'd been at Honda like two or three years, and I'd got promoted to like a production staff, which was responsible for kind of taking care of the equipment. One day I was working on a piece of equipment, and I turn around, and Scott Whitlock's standing right behind me. I'm, and and I'm, there's no one to ask why Scott Whitlock's standing behind me. <laughs> So I said, hello, Scott. I had to look at his shirt and make sure that it was him. But uh, he was just interested. He'd, uh, I think he'd got word that we had maybe a quality issue on the previous day or in the recent days. And he was just very interested in what he could do to help. And I very much appreciated the fact that he came to the spot and he actually asked questions and, and he extended his hand and said, what can I do to help you? So I really appreciated that. You know, maybe uh, just tee off of that quality comment. I think that uh, maybe there are no two words that go together better than <laughs> Honda and uh, quality. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe Rob, you could give us your, your perspective of that commitment uh, and relentless commitment to uh, the quality of the product over the years. Yeah, I think uh, quality is something that obviously we spend a lot of time and energy focusing on. And probably in the last few years, the, uh, the competition's obviously closing in on us. So, you know, we understand that we have to do things differently, and we've got we've to take some kind of risky steps in, in terms of making sure that the, the quality that we provide to the customer is, is world class. Obviously, we're competing with a lot of, uh, of tough competitors out there, and we're trying to expand our uh, export market. You know, we started out building two or three different collars and a couple different trim packages and now we're sending cars all over the world so we understand that it's a global perspective and we've got people that are watching us from around the world right now and quite honestly we found out through some of that exercise that uh, different regions of the world require different quality expectations and what we're doing is trying to take the most stringent expectations and apply that across the board so that's really helped us in our quest to, to get on top. <laughs> So, Rick, over the last uh, couple of months, um, you all have announced, uh, you know, continued investment, several hundred million dollars here in Ohio. You know, we think about it in Marysville, uh, but it's at East, East Liberty, and it's at Anna, it's in Russell's Point, uh, and it's not all about automobiles. It's about, uh, it's about power plants. It's about uh, transmissions. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about the engine side of your business and uh, the importance of that aspect uh, here in Ohio? We have two really key plants for Honda, uh, for all of North America, but they're located right here in Ohio. Uh, the first is our Anna engine plant over in Shelby County, which is about, uh, and the plant's about 40 miles north of Dayton, right along I-75. And there we have the capacity to build 1.2 million auto engines per year, and uh, we're, we're doing that there. And then nearby there in Logan County, in a little town called Russell's Point, is Honda Transmission Manufacturing where we're manufacturing our transmissions, and we make about 1.1 million transmissions per year. So if you remember, I said we make about 700,000 cars per year. We make a lot more engines and transmission. That means we're shipping those engines and transmissions made in Ohio here to Indiana, to Ontario, and to, uh, to places beyond. And it's really interesting for us, uh, for Rob and me working, working at Honda, there's a different culture on what we call the frame side, that's the vehicle side, versus the, the powertrain side, or the, the engine and transmission side. Over on the powertrain side, their world is microns, whereas in Rob's world, it's, it's millimeters. And to be honest, the, 
the folks on the uh, powertrain side kind of look down their noses at the, at the, at the, at the frame people. That, that's easy. A millimeter. <laughs> <laughs> but we are really at the beginning. It starts with this new accord that was just, uh, just uh, brought out uh, back in September of a total uh, refreshing of our powertrains. We've got a brand new direct injection engine that's in that new Accord, and also a brand new uh, CVT, or continuously variable transmission. Uh, the real heart of that transmission is a pulley, and we're machining that pulley at, at, the, uh, at the Anna engine plant and sending it over to the transmission, transmission plant. But between the increased volume of powertrains and also this new technology, you're right, it's uh, the cause for a lot of our investment and growth is on the powertrain side. Just in the past, uh, I think, 12 months alone, or two years, We've announced $500 million of investment in powertrain projects, and that's bringing about 300 new jobs uh, to, uh, to Ohio. Yeah. I mean, and just for the audience, uh, to give you a sense of scale, I think uh, the total economic development system will probably do a billion dollars of investment uh, in, in 2012 to give you a sense of uh, the dominance and the importance of uh, these continued investments. So speaking of investments, uh, back in the late 1970s, there was a governor, Jim Rhodes, who made an investment in the middle of a cornfield in a uh, test track. And I would dare say that there were many people wondering what in the world he was uh, doing. Can you comment on that investment then and its importance to attracting uh, Honda uh, at that moment in time and, and the importance of uh, that investment today? Right, you're referring to the Transportation Research Center, which is located in, uh, in uh, Union and uh, Logan counties, and we own it, by the way. It, but it's really a little-known uh, transportation industry asset here in Ohio. I, I won't do it, but if I asked how many people had heard of the TRC, I bet I'd get less than a third of the hands in this room that uh, would go up. You're right, Jim Rhodes built it in the early 70s, and uh, bigger was better for Governor Rhodes. And, there's a seven and a half mile test track and lots of other testing facilities on that, on that property. But I think it really was a key factor in Honda's decision to uh, locate in central Ohio back in the 1970s. In uh, 1988, we started the Marysville Motorcycle Plant, then the Marysville Auto Plant. In 1988, we purchased the TRC from the state of Ohio and, and other property as well in that area. We did that in order to uh, build our East Liberty plant, which opened up in, uh, in 89, and also uh, a new R&D center that was constructed on that property. So we own the TRC. It's basically a proving ground. So, again, a seven and a half mile high speed test track, crash testing facilities, lots of other facilities. We own it, but mm -hmm. TRC Inc. operates it. And TRC Incorporated is a nonprofit subsidiary of The Ohio State University. Uh, Honda's use of that uh, asset is about 30 percent, so 30 percent of the use of the TRC is Honda. The other 70 percent is other OEMs, uh, suppliers use that, and also the federal government uses it. It's uh, NHTSA, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. It's their only facility outside of uh, Washington, D.C. If there's ever a defect investigation on a car that's going on that NHTSA's carrying out, they're doing it at the, at, at the TRC. Uh, that seven and a half mile test track, we've done our best and patched it up over the years, but um, uh, it, it, it needed a, a total resurfacing. And uh, we're in the process of doing that now with, I should say, the support of the Third Frontier and ODOT, who have supported that resurfacing. I think Governor Kasich and the uh, uh, administration really understood that that asset is not simply for Honda, that's for the auto industry. We're only 30 percent of its use. So uh, we're, we're going to get a nice, uh, smooth, new test track, and we're going to need it because we have an NSX supercar that we're going to build here in Ohio, and that thing goes fast. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about the NSX. So you're not only going to build it here, you're designing it here, which I think uh, brings uh, an incredible <coughs> new uh, asset to think about uh, one of the world's uh, great supercars uh, not only being built in Ohio but being designed in Ohio. That's right. Our R&D operations consist of about uh, 1,300 engineers in Raymond, Ohio. It's, it sits literally right between our Marysville Auto Plant and our East Liberty Plant. And uh, uh, Honda R&D Americas has the responsibility for the design and development of the, uh, of the NSX. So it will be the first supercar ever produced in the state of Ohio. Uh, stay tuned. Very soon we'll be able to pin down the exact location of where that will be uh, manufactured. Uh, we'll be announcing that. You can announce it right here if you'd like. <laughs> One of my mentors was uh, Susan Inslee, and uh, Susan used to say, that's one idea. <laughs> <laughs>
but very soon it'll be uh, near our Marysville and East Liberty plants, and we're, we're really excited. And I know uh, Rob can speak about uh, uh, the associates in Marysville, for example. Uh, I think the decision by Honda to d develop and build that supercar here in Ohio really speaks to uh, the capabilities that have grown over the last 30 years. Uh, it's really going to take uh, forgive the gender reference, but a craftsman's sort of mentality to build that to build that car. It'll be different than anything else we've ever done, and I think our associates are looking forward to the opportunity to do that. Yeah. So um, you mentioned uh, Governor Kasich's investment in the Third Frontier, which was, uh, I, I think, a very creative investment by this governor that's evolving uh, the Third Frontier program. Uh, but that's a little investment, uh, you know, especially compared to the billions of dollars that you've been investing. Uh, and, you know, I had some experience with some of your competitors in another state in a, in a different lifetime. Uh, and I can tell you, you all take a different approach to uh, state involvement and assistance. More often than not, uh, you're making uh, in investments without uh, a lot of uh, help and support from uh, state, local, or federal government. And maybe you could uh, comment on that approach is uh, contrasted by uh, a lot of your competition. We have had over the years, I think, a, a, a low-key approach in, in that regard. It's not to say that we haven't had incentives, but when we are uh, using incentives, we're really trying to make sure that uh, they are for the betterment of the entire community and, uh, and not just for us. So, for example, when the Marysville plants were first built, we needed to process our wastewater. So the state of Ohio did help with some funds to uh, get a wastewater line from our site down to, to Marysville. Uh, also, the widening of U.S. Or, yeah, U.S. Route 33 so many years ago was really critically important to the, a smooth operation of our facilities. Um, but yeah, uh, every time uh, I see Governor Kasich, he tells me how much he loves Honda because we don't have our hand out so often. So, uh, <laughs> but you know, um, it, it, we we're, we kind of want to be the, the friendly neighborhood car company. You know, we need to we need to um, uh, contribute to the community to be a good neighbor. Um, I spent about four years down in Alabama and uh, at our plant in Lincoln, Alabama. On one side of Birmingham is Lincoln, where uh, on the way toward Atlanta on I-20, where Honda is located. On the other side, near Tuscaloosa, is Mercedes. And Mercedes had uh, uh, been in Alabama a few years before Honda got there. So the, the economic developers down there were coming from the Mercedes project and now working on the Honda project, and they certainly had a Mercedes mindset. So Mercedes has a customer delivery center, which is great. This, they're appealing to a different uh, customer base than we are. But also, right along the highway, there is this huge uh, logo of theirs, and it reaches up into the sky. And you can't, you can't miss that Mercedes is there, and they want to kind of scream that in the, in the way they set up their plant. Uh, we like to put our plants back a little bit, put a little mounding, so we more or less blend into the, blend into the community. And the uh, economic development people were talking about the different parcels of land required to uh, uh, prepare the site for our plant in Lincoln, Alabama. And they said to us, well, this, this piece of land right here you're going to need. And, and we said, why would we need that? He said, well, that's for your sign. <laughs> and we said, what sign? Oh, you need, you need a big sign. And the, uh, one of the Japanese members who was on the team said, oh, no need sign. Uh, no need. <laughs> <laughs> that's our approach. <laughs> You know, Rob, maybe I'll take a little personal. Um, you've, you've lived in Japan. Uh, I can't imagine how many trips you've probably uh, taken to Japan over your career. Uh, would you have ever thought uh, growing up in Richwood, Ohio, a uh, kid running around the schools and ball fields there that you'd be living in Japan uh, doing uh, everything uh, that you've done? No, never. Um, you know, when I was growing up, my trips were usually inside of Ohio. and once in a while outside the county, but a couple times I went out of the state. But I remember my first trip to Japan, it felt like I was on a plane for two days, you know. <laughs> it's, this plane is as big as like two or three double wides stacked together. And I remember getting on there and they said, you're gonna get two meals and there's movies, and I'm thinking, how long is this gonna take, you know? <laughs> and about 13 hours later, we touched down and I remember, you know, Japan's obviously uh, noted for their train system and very efficient. You know, everything's on time, but it's uh, definitely a, an experience the first time you do it. You know, when you pass one, go in the opposite direction, you kind of jump out of your skin. Looking for a place to eat, Denny's. I remember Denny's is the place that we found our first meal that night. So McDonald's weren't on every street corner like they are today, but 
yeah, it, was, it was quite an experience. But again, the Japanese, I think, if they sense in you that you're a hard worker and dedicated to the company and ambitious and want to understand their culture, I think they really embrace that. So I've, I've really had great experiences. Some of the best lessons, some of the best mentors I've had, quite honestly, have been the Japanese. I've worked with them ever since I've been there. I've just been very blessed and fortunate to be able to spend time with them, not just inside the workplace, but also outside. So yeah, it's been quite an experience for me. So the last uh, 12 to 18 months have been uh, interesting challenges as one of the world's uh, worst uh, natural disasters hit the, hit the country of Japan. And certainly uh, Honda was uh, hard hit and it had re repercussions uh, right back here to, to central Ohio, disrupting the design of the new Accord that's outside. Uh, uh, maybe you could uh, take us back, uh, either one of you, uh, over, the last, uh, over the last year uh, in the challenges, and I think all of our hearts uh, uh, poured out then and, and still do now uh, to, uh, to the home country of uh, Japan uh, and, and your, your, your thoughts and experiences through that difficult time. Yeah, obviously it was a, a terrible tragedy, and you know, <coughs> we knew a lot of the people that were there and involved and in kind of where the epicenter was. We actually had about seven or eight families in and around the area within a 100-kilometer radius of kind of the epicenter of that, so obviously there was a lot of reason for concern. We actually brought all those families back until obviously the area got, you know, more safe. And uh, a couple tasks that we had at that point, one was how to not lose sight of the startup date of the Accord with the known compression of the schedule because, again, it influenced our design facilities and many of the suppliers in the area that we actually had parts supply from. So that was one task that we knew that we had to under, undertake. The second thing was we knew that with the impact of the suppliers, it was going to cause production interruptions here. So we knew that we were going to have to make plans and accommodations for associates that would be there but weren't building cars. So we took advantage of that opportunity, quite honestly, to kind of look at our business model and, and really get inside of some of the issues that were long-standing issues. And we really took a, a, a strong approach to get the associates involved to kind of help us improve our business characteristics. You know, we, we called it FSI, Fundamental Structural Innovation. So it was, a, again, a time for us to really go out and work with the associates and try to better understand what their concerns were, what their daily struggle points were, and how we could make the business better as a unit. I, I might talk a little bit about the human side of that as well, Alex. The, um, we, we have uh, obviously Japanese nationals working in uh, Marysville and at some of our other facilities, far fewer than we used to, but uh, still they're uh, important members of the team. And uh, some of the some of the younger Japanese uh, members uh, that are working out in Marysville, they have a, uh, a group, I guess you'd call it, and they, they work together to try to understand Western culture better and so forth. So they, uh, they asked me to come to one of their meetings last summer. And uh, the purpose, the stated purpose, was for them to ask me questions and to understand how uh, Japanese uh, associates can work better with U.S. associates and understand more about our culture and so forth. So. I, I uh, answered their questions for about 45 minutes, but then I was just dying to ask them some questions, and I kind of turned the tables at the end. Uh, and again, this is probably, you know, four or five months after the tsunami. And I said, "How is the how are you, are the Japanese people doing? And what do you what do you what do you feel about this?" And they they told me two things that I can I can recall. Um, one is uh, they're they're a very they're a very strong people. Um, but they, they were talking about how they thought the younger generation in Japan maybe didn't really understand the hardships uh, over the years that uh, Japan has had to endure from, you know, in, in, their, in their long history. And they felt that uh, this, the, the earthquake and tsunami, really had brought the country much more together and really given that younger generation a, a, an opportunity to, um, to, to connect with that history and so forth. And, and they are a, a very strong and determined people, and they're, they're, they're doing well. And the second thing they told me, this, if you remember last summer uh, in the Women's Soccer World Cup, Japan beat the United States in the final. And this, I think it had just happened the previous Sunday when I met with them. And they said they were so proud of their uh, Women's World Cup soccer team. And I had to tell them, I said, um, when they played that game, I, was not, I did not have a rooting interest. If the United States won, it would be fine. If Japan won, fine with me as well. So they were very proud of that, of that moment.
So during that difficult time, a lot of uh, production came to halt. Uh, and one of the interesting things that you all did uh, is you didn't lay anybody off, uh, but rather you sent a lot of associates uh, into the community to do community work uh, on your clock. Um, you might talk about that culture and at, at the same time, I, I, I think I saw a stat recently that said $75 million of philanthropy uh, that's flowed to <laughs> big and small organizations all over uh, central Ohio in a, in a very generous uh, uh, way. Right, it's, we, we feel it's our responsibility to be a, a contributing part of the community. Uh, we did just pass that milestone of $75 million uh, contributed uh, over, the, over the years. And our, um, our footprint in Ohio, as I described the powertrain plants and the, and the frame plants, is basically from you know, Franklin County, I guess, on the east, but all the way to the Indiana border when we're, uh, we have associates from uh, places like Dark County and, and so forth. So we try to uh, do what we can and, and keep an eye on all those communities and really uh, uh, have, have philanthropic efforts there. For us, um, of course, you know, money, is, money is great, and uh, I'm sure that helps, but really arms and legs, uh, I think, are, make the most difference. So we try to encourage volunteerism. Uh, in our associates, we uh, incent that uh, if associates volunteer at a particular organization for, uh, I think, 50 hours in a, in a year or two's time, that earns another grant for that organization. And our associates are very, uh, very kind-hearted and also very, uh, very skilled. So, when we had the production down situation, it wasn't a, a hard connection to make that. Well, we can make a difference in the community if we're not able to build cars for uh, a day or two a week. So. Uh, our, and our, our folks uh, responded well, and uh, thanks to uh, Caroline and Wendy who are sitting down there who uh, are part of our uh, corporate affairs group, uh, we arranged some of those opportunities, and as usual, our Honda associates responded well. So I'm gonna uh, begin to uh, turn it to the audience and invite uh, anybody to, <coughs> the, um, to the microphone uh, for uh, questions, and gonna, as we do that, turn uh, one final question from my standpoint. Uh, back to manufacturing, uh, you know, a trend that, Kenny McDonald and our team at Columbus 2020 are seeing, and Deb Shear and Matt McAllister just got back uh, from a very productive trip to Japan, uh, is a strong tendency to see manufacturing uh, coming back in a real robust way uh, here in the Midwest. And I'd be interested in your uh, perspective in the, in the world trends that you're seeing around manufacturing. Yeah, I mean, for, for our company, um, we're, we're growing here in, uh, in North America. and. Um, just due to uh, economic conditions um, and the, uh, again, the capabilities of our associates here in North America, uh, we're seeing a lot more exports. You know, Rob talked about exports a little bit. We'll, we'll export our millionth car next month. Uh, so I think, I think Scott might have driven the first one onto the boat back in 1987. Um, but we've done 999,999 since then, Scott. And uh, so we'll get our millionth export in, uh, in uh, December. We'll export about 100,000 cars in 2012, and we anticipate that number doubling uh, in the years to come. We're also doing something that we haven't done before. We're starting to see more parts exporting. So again, we have lots of our suppliers here today. Um, it's making sense for uh, uh, components to be produced here in North America and then shipped to, you, know, you name it, Turkey or Asia or South America uh, to be used in our assembly operations there. So we're seeing, and then also going to see more models develop here. We mentioned the NSX, but you know Honda has a couple of global models, things like the Civic, the uh, CRV, and the Accord. That's those those vehicles are sold throughout the world, and honestly, those vehicles have been developed in Japan up until now. Um, but beginning with the next version of the Civic, which is a few years out, uh, that vehicle will be uh, developed here in the United States. And it'll be up to us on the manufacturing side to launch those vehicles first and then help other Honda plants throughout the world uh, with their launch of that same vehicle. So we're really seeing uh, quite a bit of um, new responsibility, new complexity come into our business. And uh, I think we're going to need all the know-how and knowledge that we gained in the last 30 years in order to be successful in the next five or ten. Open it up. Good, good afternoon. I'm Jim Rutledge from the law firm of Bricker and Eckler. Congratulations on 30 years. Rick, I note you've uh, worked with Honda uh, not only in Ohio, but also in Indiana and Alabama. Would you please uh, describe the business environment in those states compared to Ohio? They're all different, I'll say that. 
Uh, I think one of the one of the real uh, benefits that we're seeing lately in Ohio is when the when the uh, tax the Ohio sale uh, tax was re reformed back in 2005 with the elimination of the uh, personal property tax and the um, uh, establishment of the cat tax that really has been a big help to manufacturers. I'm also chair of the board of the uh, Ohio Manufacturers Association, and I know our members are uh, really ap appreciate that. One of the areas where I think we have some work to do here in Ohio, and I'll compare this to Indiana, is in the area of workforce development. I think in Indiana there's a real strong um, uh, group that is helping to uh, educate as far as uh, technical skills. You know, for our production associates, the ones who build the cars and powertrains every day, we've been very, very satisfied with, with, with those associates. And the technology requirements for them have increased over time, but they're responding well. The weakness that we see is in what we call maintenance technicians or equipment service technicians. The factory floor of the 1980s is nothing like the factory floor of the 2010s. We're living in a digital world, and that the factory floor is no, is no different than that. Uh, I think they've done a better job in Indiana to um, uh, recognize that and to put together some kinds of uh, training programs. We had uh, the Development Services Agency Director uh, uh, Chris Schmenk came up to Honda just, I think it was just last week, and we were talking to her about this. But, you know, Rob, you can talk about um, the, the, the um, increased uh, technical requirements for our uh, maintenance and equipment service associates. Yeah, like Rick said, you know, back in the early days, much of the equipment was air operated, hydraulics, and in some cases, you know, use your hands to clamp parts together or whatnot. But uh, most recently, we've started working on advancing some of the technology because of the vehicle. I mean, the, the new Accord obviously has a lot of features that require us to calibrate and, and set cameras and radar units, for example, for all the safety features. So, you know, this, uh, this last generation Accord was probably one of our first steps towards advancing our technologies. And, you know, the, the big difference is when you have an air leak, you can kind of see it and anyone can fix it. But when you have electronics and everything's digital, obviously that becomes more problematic when you don't have the right staff. And the interface with the user and the engineering folks and the maintenance folks is, is just obviously that's something that we need to continue to figure out how to how to better overcome because you know that's that's one of the things that moving forward we understand is going to be a huge requirement as far as the product line goes. And we're not sitting on our hands about that. We've uh, worked with a consortium of four uh, community colleges: uh, Road State, uh, Marion. Clark State and Columbus State here in town to try to get a common curriculum for uh, uh, equipment service technicians for the future. But I think marketing is the issue. How to, how to uh, as Alex, you mentioned, uh, maybe the reputation of factories in the old days as being uh, dirty, dark, and dangerous or something like that. And they're anything, they're anything but that. But how to get uh, you know, either young people or people who are unemployed or underemployed to be interested in that as a career. I'm telling you, you can get an associate degree at a community college, come out with a lot less debt, and make a pretty darn good living. And there's going to be jobs available. We're, we're looking at a huge retirement wave. When, you, when your company's 30 years old, some people are getting, like me, getting older. So we're looking at a retirement wave in the next you know, uh, three to seven years. And there's going to be plenty of jobs uh, in our facilities and in our supplier facilities uh, for, for that. Uh, Alabama, I didn't say anything about Alabama. They're, um, you know, that state, when we, when we went down there in the um, early 2000s, they were really hungry to establish a, a, an auto industry down there, and they've, they've, done, a, they've done a fairly good job. Their, their tax system is uh, uh, a lot different. Our, you know, the, the, uh, the in state income tax is low. You, you pay a lot for sales tax, uh, um, and then Indiana's, Indiana's both, both Alabama and Indiana's workers' comp systems are, are uh, much better for employers than our workers' comp system, but step-by-step, uh, step we'll get better. Thank you. Once again, congratulations. Thank you. George O'Donnell, uh, CMC trustee. Rob, when you were an upstart uh, employee uh, on the line in 85, I was very likely going through the plant as on a tour. And I was impressed with the percentage of robotics at the time. With the two cars out front, what percentage change have you seen in robotic construction between then and now? And then the next question, if I may, what different types of propulsion are you talking about 
for the next 10, 15 years of cars rather than petrol? Uh, I guess the first question, the automation question, <coughs> from what I remember, we had uh, very few robots. Actually, there was a lot of hand welding, a lot of hand painting, and a lot of hand installing and assembly at the time. And uh, about 10 years ago, we went through what we called innovation and, and primarily the weld section, but we've also done things since then in the painting section. So basically every car gets welded together by robots and painted by robots. And the only kind of associate intervention is when there's some sort of repair to make. So uh, again, I think it's probably three or four levels. It's probably 20% automation on the 85 compared to fully automated on the 2013. So definitely in the last 30 years, we've, we've improved our automation. As far as the uh, propulsion, uh, the internal combustion engine won't be here forever. It's, it's still got some life to it, but uh, maybe in some of the lifetimes of people in this room, it'll be, it'll, it will not be a part anymore. We are involved in all kinds of different uh, alternative uh, fuel technologies. We're the only automaker uh, with a natural gas uh, uh, engine, we have that in our in our Civic. Um, we, we make it in line. The others are doing some conversions to natural gas, but we actually make it in line. We'll build in Indiana. We'll build a internal combustion engine, gasoline powered Civic, and right behind it will come a natural gas powered Civic. Uh, hybrid hybrid electric uh, is we look at as a transition technology, and then so we're talking about in the longer term future whether electric vehicles will be acceptable to customers in performance wise or hydrogen. Uh, we happen to think uh, fuel cell and hydrogen still has some possibility. I think it's uh, uh, maybe taken a couple of steps back in recent years, especially in this country, as there's been a, uh, a push toward more uh, uh, support for electric vehicles. And, and by the way, we think the, the, we think the consumer ought to finally decide what they want to drive and how they want to drive it. We don't think the government should be in the business of picking technologies uh, for the future. Uh, but we are a very uh, strong technical company. We're an engineering company. The engineers are in charge, and we'll, we'll never forget that. Um, but one, I, I, really, I really am proud of HANA's ability to respond to a technical challenge. So we're ready with natural gas. We're ready with hybrid electric. We, we do have uh, electric vehicle for the FIT uh, coming out, and we have, uh, we have a prototype hydrogen-powered vehicle on the road. So uh, talking, we were talking about the casinos. We got, we got cards all over the table, so we're ready to go where the, where the customer wants us to go. And uh, I don't think anybody, if, if, you had a, if, if you had a good crystal ball, you could make a lot of money deciding what's going to be the long-term future of propulsion for vehicles in, uh, around the world. Time for two more quick questions. Uh, yes, my name is John McKnight, and I work for Rife's Auto Body, a, a collision repair shop here in Columbus. Um, so I'm in the automotive industry. Um, piggybacking on the question you were just addressing, um, you know, Honda's always been established as a leader in the automotive industry, but it seems to me that you're taking a little bit of a backseat to some other manufacturers when it comes to uh, alternative fuels, whether it be hybrid technology or others. Um, obviously, you're still very much involved in that, but there's the Toyota Prius and all of their hybrids, the Chevy Volt, and I might guess that a lot of people in the room have never even heard of the Honda Insight. Um, why is that? Why is Honda... Uh, either taking the back seat or, or uh, I don't know, why do I have that impression? Why aren't you guys out in the front with that? Thank you. Toyota's done a great job. The Honda Insight was the first hybrid electric vehicle sold in the United States uh, years ago. We brought the natural gas car Civic out back in um, uh, uh, 98 or 99, I think it was. So we've had alternative tech, uh, vehicles out there. Um, I would just give props to Toyota. The Prius has become synonymous with with hybrid, and they've 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 done a good job. They're a, they're a, one of the key competitors in this industry, and we're fighting with them as well as fighting against a lot of other companies. The the big three are a lot stronger uh, now, and they've got some very good product offerings out there. Uh, we're well positioned. We'll have a hybrid. Uh, we have a hybrid version of this Accord uh, coming out, um, putting hybrid in a lot of our different vehicles. Um, uh, maybe in recent years, especially given our, some of our production troubles, our numbers have been down a little bit, but uh, we feel pretty strong about our, our, our capabilities in the, in the area of alternative fuels. And as I just said, we're, we're ready to go uh, in any number of directions, and uh, we think we'll be a strong, a strong force for alternative uh, 
fuel vehicles in the future. Last question. Hi, my name's Marie Trudeau. I'm with W.E. Davis Insurance. And thank you for spending time with us today. Uh, I spent a lot of my time unraveling healthcare, the healthcare puzzle with people. With your thousands of employees, do you see the Affordable Care Act making much of an impact on you, especially 2014? Thank you. Yeah, we have a we, we have a very good active health care plan for our for our associates and have had that for a long time. Um, I think the issue that we're that what we're trying to do now in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, competitiveness is really more wellness. Uh, I think as a as a as a society. Um, we're, we're a little, we have a little too many pounds on us sometimes, and maybe we have some other issues. So we're really trying to encourage our associates to uh, uh, go down the wellness route. We incent that. Um, if an associate uh, can accumulate a certain number of points, for either for getting preventative checkups, for uh, running the 5K race, or doing something like that, uh, then they're going to be eligible for a, 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 a more uh, a higher level medical plan than those who aren't willing to, to make those decisions. So I think we're still waiting to see how um, the uh, uh, health care plan uh, pans out as it get, gets fully implemented. Uh, we don't have any intentions of making huge changes to our uh, active health care plan, but we're really focusing on wellness right now. Thank you, gentlemen. If, uh, if you care, we, I think the Metropolitan Club would love to volunteer the, to be at the spot for the unveiling of the new, <laughs> 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 new NSX. It would be fun to do. We'll have it out at the track if you like. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, the other thing that uh, Honda has brought to, um, to Ohio, and particularly to, Cent uh, to Central Ohio, and it's one of my hobbies, restaurants, is we have better Japanese cuisine in Central Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to you guys, than <laughs> any place between New York and uh, Los Angeles. Um, want to? Uh, I hope you all enjoyed today's uh, forum. Uh, we can you can share this with friends uh, by sending them to YouTube, and there's a link from our CMC website. Um, sign up for next week. Uh, Seven billion worth of Ohio tax loopholes. We'll all want to find some of those. <laughs> and um, also, don't forget the jingle mingle on the 27th. Uh, we can continue today's conversation out in the lobby with some coffee and cookies. Once more, we want to thank our sponsors today, Corna Cocosing and Caster Connections. Thank you, gentlemen. And most importantly, Rick, Rob, and Alex, thank you very much.